Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be today. Um, welcome to Panorama and Premier International's uh, webinar, Seven Steps to Data Conversion Success, Navigating Your Implementation. Um, myself, Jeff McPherson, uh, Director of Client Services at Panorama Consulting Solutions. And then with me on the line also is Kate Miller. She's a Principal of Data Migration Services at our um, partners, Premier International. Um, we have a special offer today, um, one hour of free uh, consulting time from the Panorama uh, team. Um, the details of that will be provided at the end of uh, this presentation. So let's jump straight into what we'll be looking at today. Uh, there'll be the introduction to Panorama Consulting, introduction to Premier International, project execution around an implementation, and questions and answers at the end. Um, we'll look to get through the presentation in around uh, 40 minutes and enough time for your questions at the end. For those of that you had listened to our um, webinar earlier, uh, end of last year, um, this is um, part two of that. This is the implementation. You listened previous to the uh, pre-implementation component. So for Panorama, we're an independent um, ERP consulting firm. Uh, we focus around digital transformation, OCM, implementation, selection, um, aligning IT strategy with your business strategies. Um, and in those markets, we're looking at manufacturing, distribution, uh, retail, energy, um, just to name a few. And then when we're looking at from our consultants, our consultants have a, a lot of industry knowledge, um, 15, 20 years, uh, certified in, uh, with PMPs, uh, APEX, ProSide, et cetera. So a well-balanced team with a lot of experience across a lot of industries, um, and we've been helping companies um, in the U.S. and around the world for the last uh, 15 years. Uh, some of those organizations that we've helped, um, you can see the list of there, and, and it's all from manufacturing to nonprofits, um, um, you know, for, and everything else that in between from oil and gas um, to distribution. So, Kate, I will hand it over to you to um, introduce Premier International. Thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, my name is Kate Meller. I'm a principal with Premier International. And at Premier, we specialize in data migration. We've been doing this type of work for more than 30 years, and we do work across all platforms and industries. We've worked with companies of all sizes around the world to ensure a smooth deployment of their selected systems, specifically in the realm of data migration. While every company is different, they face many of the same challenges when it comes to their data. Our mission is to remove the risk from that data migration and ensure that your data is not driving the project critical success path. Data migration, sometimes referred to as data conversion, can be a challenge if you go in unprepared. During our time together today, we will be reviewing seven key steps that will help you avoid some of the common challenges that companies face with this type of project. Before we, before we dive in, let's get everyone on the same page as to what we're referring to when we say data migration or conversion. We see this as encompassing everything between the time you start extracting the data from your existing legacy systems to the point that it is in your new target system and ready for use by your business. Successful execution of a data migration requires the coordination of people, process, and technology. All three aspects need to work in concert across these steps, starting with the pre-implementation planning and going all the way through to the data validation at the end of the process to make sure that everything that you need in your new system is there and is ready for your use. Throughout this presentation, we'll be talking about each of these steps in detail. So one question we hear from every client is, when should we start thinking about data migration? Uh, the answer is now. If you're planning an implementation or already down the path of starting an implementation and you're not thinking about data, you're already behind. You should be thinking about data migration right from the start. There's several things to think about when answering that question. Uh, data always takes more time than you think it will, and data quality is never as good as you think it should be. The way that you think your data is being used today or assumptions that you might have about what's actually in your data sets are often incomplete or even incorrect. Uh, your data landscape likely contains some data sources known only to a few people, and these sources have a habit of popping up once you're already pretty far down the path of, of your implementation. 
to add more complexity to the process. Uh, data migration is something most companies don't deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. You probably don't have an internally designed process to tackle this kind of project. All of these things kind of contribute to the fact that you, there really is no too early to be starting to think about data migration. Yeah, and I think Kate, there yeah, the, the two points you know we see from a lot of from an end user perspective is people underestimate the size of a data conversion, and I think the piece is that leadership is not educated of what the scope is of a, of a data conversion, and then they're making you know poor decisions on poor information. Yeah, absolutely. It's really easy to look at data migration and see it as just moving data from A to B. There's a lot of things that are happening within that move from A to B. And if you're not thinking them through clearly, you're going to get surprises um, once you're trying to be up and running in your new system. So that brings us to the first step of the seven steps in today's session, pre-implementation planning, which was the subject of our previous webinar in this series. In that prior webinar, we talked about how to consider data migration as part of your planning phase. Coming out of pre-implementation, you should have already addressed the seven items on this checklist here to help guide your implementation. If you did not, this is where you need to start. If you tackle your data migration without these decisions and definitions in place, you will struggle. If you missed the previous discussion, which covers these particular topics in more depth, you can find it on Panorama's website by searching for seven steps to data conversion success within their webinars. Yeah, you know, I think the piece here is really taking this time to do this because you have to do all these steps. Um, and you rush into an implementation without doing these steps, you'll end up doing it. It'll take longer, um, and there'll be a lot of more, a lot more pain around that. Absolutely. So the second step, uh, once you have all of your planning in place, involves cross-team collaboration. Data migration is absolutely a collaboration. Implementations often consist of sub-teams, each with their own expertise and responsibilities. Data migration is an area that cuts across many of these teams, including the data migration team, the data owners, your process owners, your vendor experts, and program management. Just as a start, um, there could be contributions from other teams required as well. Data migration is a technical solution to a business problem. While IT may be executing your migration, your process owners should be driving the requirements. Keeping these teams connected is crucial to making sure that everyone has the same understanding that no assumptions are being made without confirmation from the business and that nothing gets lost along the way. Without all of these teams working together and communicating regularly, your risk of failure due to data issues increases dramatically. Yeah, I think that the main point you're pointing out there, you know, this is really is a business issue. Because if you think about data, IT is kind of a step away from it from a business function perspective. Um, those business owners, process owners, data owners, they're close to it. They use it every day, um, and they know all the ins and outs. Um, so that's, and they've got to make the decisions of what it's going to be like in the future. So it's definitely a business project. They need to be involved, and there needs to be a lot of education and information passed back between your IT teams and, and your um, business side of the organization. Absolutely. So let's talk about these teams and their responsibilities as it pertains to data migration in a little bit more, more detail. So your process owners bring the understanding of your legacy system, so the things that you're running today, uh, how things are structured, how you're using your system, and what those business requirements are. This is what's driving uh, your process. Your vendor experts bring the other side of the coin. They bring the target system design expertise. They can help you to understand how you fulfill your vision on their product. The data migration team brings the understanding of your data content, data cleansing, transformation process, and migration techniques while also bridging that functional technical divide, kind of helping the teams talk to each other and make sure that what your business needs is what they're getting from a, from a solution perspective. And then the project management team helps to coordinate and keep everyone on track to the overall project plan. There can be cases where a single person fulfills multiple of these roles. Uh, and that's, that's okay. Um, there can also be cases where you have different teams that fill each of these roles. Making sure that all of those teams are working together is, is the key here. Yeah, and a piece of that project management team is also keeping the executives in line of, of what is going on and what that scope is of the data conversion. Absolutely. So that brings us to step number three. So now we're starting to get into tangible deliverables. Step number three involves your comprehensive conversion requirements. As part of your design phase, 
you'll be defining robust conversion specifications and mappings. Now these go beyond discussions around data selection and down into that detailed field level transformational logic. How do you take what you have today and make it do what you need it to do tomorrow? while also accounting for the fact that your new system is likely structured differently than your existing system. So your conversion specification should reflect an understanding of the reality of your legacy data, comprehensive conversion rules, regardless of how they're implemented. They should account for any data cleansing that needs to happen or any data gaps that need to be bridged as part of the migration process and define any harmonization and augmentation requirements. And finally, include any air conditions which you need to be on the lookout for based on your business needs and requirements. By having everything in one place, in one set of specifications, that helps ensure that all of your teams are clear as to what's being done to the data as it moves from point A to point B, and also helps prepare you for any audit requests down the road. Yeah, it's interesting, Kate, on these, you know, what we see is, you know, you, you talk to clients about this and, and it makes sense. Um, when you talk to them, but it's amazing how many organizations do not take this into account. Yeah, and that, that comes back to that, I think, the, the misunderstanding that you mentioned a little bit earlier, Jeff, in that people are seeing that this as, I'm just moving my data from A to B. Yes, you are, but you're also taking it through the back roads and the byways as you do that to make sure that it ends up exactly where it needs to be and not just in a clone of what you have today. You're, you're putting in a new solution for a reason. Um, you're not just re-implementing what you already have, so you need to take that into account when you're doing this. So as you work on defining your conversion specifications, the business is an invaluable participant. No one is closer to how your data interacts than your team members who interact with it on a daily basis to do their jobs. They can tell you about the pain points that exist today, workarounds that they've developed because the current system doesn't do exactly what they need it to, and what other external systems they might be using to do their jobs. Maybe they have a private access database or a spreadsheet somewhere that they use to keep track of all of their customer contacts. Without these types of conversations, you might not find out about that until they start asking where their data is in the new system. Well, it's not there because you didn't know it existed. Um, other things to keep in mind during the design phase are what governance standards you want to have in place or that you might want to implement in the future. Do your conversion rules reflect these requirements? If you're considering pursuing data governance or master data management once you're in your new system, your conversion process is a great way to start hammering these things into shape and get a jump start. Uh, finally, uh, as part of your conversion design and your requirements definition, you should be considering your reporting requirements and your KPIs. Do your conversion rules give you the flexibility to generate the reports that you'll need going forward? Have you undertaken a cleansing activity to ensure your data is structured and bucketed correctly to make your reports accurate? The time that's going into an implementation project is a time that you have people paying closer attention to some of these questions than they might on a normal day-to-day -day basis. And so your conversion becomes a great place to take advantage of to get some of this cleaned up in your data, things that you just never quite get to in the normal course of business. Yeah, and Kate, it's interesting you talk about complexities, and, and sometimes what we see is around historical data uh, where people are bring in, say, two years of sales history, and the, the way sales history was handled in year one versus year two may have been different, so really there's got to be different logic of how you look at different data um, from one year to another. Right, and that, and that brings us back to one of the topics that we covered in our last webinar, Jeff, in terms of what is your, what is your archiving strategy, what is your data warehousing strategy, and so those are things that you can be thinking through as part of this as well to make life easier for you. Absolutely. So as you're defining your conversion specifications, one thing that you might not think to consider is your environment strategy. You might be looking at this and think, hey, this is really more of an infrastructure problem and I don't, I don't know why I'm thinking about this in terms of data conversion or data migration. Um, the reason that you care about your target environment strategy as part of data migration is that the last step of conversion is the loading of data into your new target system and making sure that everything gets in. In order to do this, you need some place to actually test that load process. That is, you need a target environment. Environment, environmental refreshes take time, and they need to be scheduled in advance to support your testing schedule. Uh, this is even more critical if you are going into a cloud solution where you don't have as much control over your environments as you did in an on-premise world. If you're managing your own target system uh, on-premise, you may be able to turn around a refresh of an environment very quickly. Uh, but if you are going into a cloud solution, you may have to schedule that well in advance with your vendor to make sure that you get the refreshment you need it. 
And then once you have your environment refreshed, making sure it's configured is critical. If you try to load data which violates your configuration, you're going to have a really hard time. Okay, do you see companies having just, just an environment just for data conversion in the new system? Yeah, it depends. Um, and I know that's a very wishy-washy answer, uh, but let me tell you why it depends. Um, depending on if you are going into cloud, you have to take a close look at what your contract allows you, how many environments you have available. You may or may not be able to dedicate one strictly to data conversion, especially early in a project before you get into your first formal test cycle before you get into your conference room pilot, it can be very useful to have a dedicated conversion environment that you can test the loads and make sure that all of the kinks are worked out. Uh, once you get into your conference room pilot um, phase of the project, you then want to kind of align your conversion tests with your overall system testing so that your process testing is happening on converted data. So one thing that we see clients do is dedicate an environment to conversions up front at the beginning of the project and over time that environment goes back into the overall bucket of, of environments if you will and it's no longer a dedicated conversion environment but is able to be used for other types of things uh, just as you would consider your target environment strategy you should also be considering your legacy environment strategy Validating a data migration is incredibly difficult when you're chasing a moving target. So to help reduce this challenge, cloning or freezing a copy of your data sources just in advance of each test cycle can be a very good idea. There are limitations you may encounter. You may not have enough space on your legacy box to take that snapshot, uh, but to the degree possible, this is something you should be considering. If you are able to take that clone to use for migration test cycles, uh, consider the timing of when you do that. If you have day-end jobs which sync up your transactions uh, at 1 or 2 a.m., you should schedule your clone to take place once those are done so you have clean, tied-up data that you're using not only to test your conversion processes, but then to also validate what loaded against a static set of data. That way you're not having to explain, oh, this number doesn't tie because it was a timing issue. You can only say the word timing issue so much before people stop believing it. So as you start moving out of design and into build, the question becomes, where are we doing all of this work that we've been talking about? So this brings us to step number four, um, using a centralized data repository. When you think about where the actual heavy lifting of data migration should happen, there's basically three primary options. The first place would be, let's do our transformations in our legacy system, get our data as close as possible to what we need it to be in the future, and then just spit it out and load it into our target. There's a number of challenges with that, not the least of which your legacy system is structured generally very differently from what your target system needs to have provided to it. So you're now trying to make your legacy system do something that it's not designed for. And by doing that, you're adding risk to your existing ongoing daily business. Uh, the last thing that you wanna do is break your business today while you're in the process of, of getting into your new solution. So the legacy system typically is not a good way to be doing transformational logic. So what about so, your target? Oh, sorry, Kate. I was just going to ask is, you know, when we look at that legacy one, sometimes we see clients, now especially around customers, you know, we have people like in customer service that have free time in the morning so they're not as busy as in the afternoon where they could go in and clean data. Is that, are you suggesting that is something that's possible? In, in your experience, that's probably not the best way to um, cleanse some of that data. Yeah, that's a really good question, and we'll talk a little bit about data cleansing in our in our next key point, but to, to answer your question directly, if there is data cleanup that needs to happen and uh, the decision is taking that the best way to clean it up is to do it in legacy, so for instance, let's say you have customer information that is missing the city field, the city is just blank, um, that's a very easy fix to go into legacy and just add it there. You're probably not breaking any processes by doing that. You're not really transforming the data, you're filling a gap that exists today. So that would be a case where doing cleansing in a legacy system might make sense. Now, if we were to say that you have uh, staying on the top of, a cu of customers, let's say you have a country code that is a four-digit country code today that's specific to your system, and your new system wants to use a standard two-digit country code. Now, going into legacy and changing all of your four-digit country codes to the two-digit code that the new system requires, that's probably a bad idea because you've now broken everything that drives off of that in legacy. So that would be a case where that sort of transformation absolutely should not be happening in legacy. 
Okay. That makes yeah, absolutely sense. Yeah, you, know, you don't want to change that structure, but you do want to have um, clean, basic, mm -hmm. fundamental mm -hmm. data that's not changing. Okay. Yeah, so when it when it comes to cleansing and cleaning up your data, there are times that that makes sense to do in legacy, but transformational, no, you really shouldn't be doing it in your legacy system. So if we're if we're saying you can't do it in your legacy system, your next thought might be, well, I'll just do it in my target system. I'll load up what I have today and then manipulate it to do what I need it to do tomorrow. Um, so my number one question to you on that would be, why would you put unconverted or unclean data that you know isn't right into the brand new system that you're putting a lot of effort into deploying? Um, additionally, that system probably isn't even going to be up and ready for you to do that until well down the road after you need to start your data conversion work. So especially in a cloud world, uh, you have much less opportunity to even manipulate the data once it's into the new system programmatically. So trying to do a data conversion in the target system, you're going to get yourself into a mess very, very quickly. So that's not really a good place to be doing this type of work. So what does that leave? Um, kind of somewhere in the middle, someplace between your legacy system and your target system. And that would be in a centralized data repository. So a centralized data repository typically can connect to all of your different data sources, can replicate your target system structures, and allow for the repetitive, heavy lifting transformational work to be automated. Uh, some people look at this and say, okay, I'm just going to do everything in Excel. I'm going to use a lot of VLOOKUPs. I'm going to use some transform logic in Excel. There you go. I'm good. I've got a data conversion. Uh, Excel is good for many, many things. Excel is generally not good for anything but the most simplistic data conversions. Um, and Excel is not a centralized repository. So unless you're talking about data on the order of you know, dozens, uh, you probably don't want to be doing this in Excel. So what might this look like? Um, this image here kind of shows everything centralized around your data repository, all of your inputs and outputs ending up with data going into your target system. Using this data repository allows you to consider disparate legacy systems in a single location, execute any data augmentation or harmonization that you need to do, test and retest against stationary sets of data without impacting either your legacy or your target systems. You can facilitate many test cycles, manage data cleansing activities, and even reconcile your data post-conversion. Um, you can also even run a mock conversion that does everything up to the load. So you can get output files, you can get error reporting, you can get a look at the health of your data migration and figure out what is going to fail even before you try to load. This allows you to pull the entire activity earlier into your project timeline. You're not having to wait until you have a fully configured environment to get a look at what your converted data is going to be like and where there might be gaps. So we discussed using a data repository to help manage data cleansing activities. We also talked a little bit about manual data cleanup and legacy. This brings us right up to step number five, which is ongoing data cleansing and harmonization, which should continue throughout the course of the project. So what do we mean by that? Data cleansing involves uh, addressing missing and or incomplete data that might exist today. This process is driven by your process owners. The data migration team or your IT team can help identify these scenarios, but all cleansing decisions should come back to your process owners. That is, your IT team should not be making decisions about what to do with the data that's not at the direction of your process owners. So data cleansing starts by characterizing the issues, so defining what are the problems that we have within our data set. Uh, going back to the example from before, maybe we have customers that are missing a city code or customers that don't have a postal code defined, or that are missing some sort of collection manager that's required. Uh, that would be defining the issues. And along with that, you are prioritizing. So you can look at the, what are my number one priorities? What are the number two? And what are kind of the nice to haves, but I'm not gonna have a problem if I go live without fixing it. By being able to prioritize that, you can direct your team's uh, work activity. The second step of data cleansing would involve harmonization. So when we talk about harmonization, that is, deduplication of your data at the direction of the business. So this is typically very common among customers, suppliers, items, uh, that master level data, that you will likely have duplicate information uh, within your system today. And if you're trying to combine multiple systems as part of your deployment, the likelihood that you have that duplication goes up even more. So identifying that and being able to account for that as part of your conversion is very important. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few slides here. 
Um, data cleansing also involves data enrichment. So that's the collection or definition of data, which doesn't exist today, but that you will need tomorrow. Maybe you decide as part of your migration that you're going to require all of your customers to have DNB information defined. If you don't have that today, you may need to go through an exercise to collect that and make sure that it gets applied as part of your move. Rectification uh, involves correcting for these data quality issues. So how are you actually fixing it? Are you fixing it in the conversion? Or are you just going to manually clean it up? And then finally, monitoring your cleansing progress. So making sure that the data quality continues to improve and doesn't slide backwards once you stop paying attention for five minutes. So once you have identified all of your issues, then you can come up with the processes and procedures for resolving these issues. And there's kind of three different options for it here for how you clean it up. Uh, you can clean it up manually in legacy. That's going back to the example that Jeff mentioned of maybe you have a CS manager who has an hour every morning that can go in and just fix the data in a legacy system. That would be an option depending on the volumes that you're dealing with. The second option would be an automated conversion cleanup. So that would be writing some sort of rule as part of your conversion specifications to account for some systemic issue or to plug some of the gaps programmatically based on a rule that you can define. And the third option would kind of be the hybrid approach that maybe there's some of it that you can clean up manually and there's some of it that you can define an automated rule for. So there's no hard and fast answer for every single issue that you encounter. It's kind of a, a taking a look at what the issue is, what the impact is, and what your options are for cleaning it up. And throughout the course of the project, you'll be using all three of these options to get your data into the state that you need it for. Yeah, I think that the piece here that you know we're seeing with, with Permian International is having that central repository allows you to do a lot more testing cycles of your data um, before you actually get to your target system. So when you know you've got the technical resources in there doing design and build, normally most companies wait to their first conference room pilot to do their testing of their data, and it's kind of like you know, what's behind the curtain type of thing. Um, but have it in that central repository during that build phase where there's, there's less uh, commitment of resources from the organization um, because the technical resources are building and configuring the system allows you to do so many cycles through that. Um, and it just, it provides, it's just quicker. So when you do get to your first conference room pilot, your data can be 80, 90% accurate rather than what, you know, if you don't have that, a lot of, you know, historically what's normally happened is the data is like 20, 30% accurate. Um, and then makes that conference room pilot very kind of clunky, and we sometimes see organizations to being forced to have another conference room pilot. Something to think about, you know, when you talk about the, the structure of how you set up the data uh, conversion process. Yeah, and uh, to, to give an example of that, uh, I'm currently working on a project where they just did their first test cycle, they just did their conference room pilot, but before that, we had been doing data cleansing work with them for a couple of months, We've actually already gone through, I think, seven or eight different cycles uh, of cleansing checkpoints with them before we got to their first test cycle. So they were able to clean up thousands of problems that they had. Uh, they found a couple of cases where there was a bug in their purchase order process today that was leaving purchase orders open for years on end that they didn't have visibility to. Um, so they were able to identify that through the cleansing process. And because they fixed it before we got the conference room pilot, they didn't have to wade through all of that old bad data as part of their, as part of their review. Um, and th that's kind of what this, this dashboard here is showing. Dashboards like this can help the process owners to keep an eye on their, their data cleansing status and also, also provide that really quick overview to project management or to executives who can then quickly see where issues exist what's getting better and what's trending in the wrong direction so that they can deploy their resources appropriately. Yeah, I mean, this 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 is that what I'm seeing, you know, it's more the norm and what Premium International is bringing to the table is this analytics out of the central repository just allows that process to happen so much quicker, better feedback, quicker feedback, um, and you're not hitting the issues when you're trying to go through a process within the system. Um, and it allows you to find records that you may have a, a manufacturing item, but it has no bomb. And it's quick analysis, you can give the data, um, and they can be addressed. So it, it's extremely helpful. So part of the data cleansing that we mentioned is considering data harmonization. So what do we actually mean by this, and why should you consider this as part of your pro process? 
Um, duplicate customer and supplier data is incredibly common among different companies, uh, both within a single legacy system, but also across multiple legacy systems. And even between a legacy system and a target system, if you're doing a phase deployment where you've already taken one site up and you're in the process of taking a second site. So harmonization can help you optimize your system performance and also improve your reporting clarity and the usefulness of your KPIs. It's a lot easier to understand your spend if you have one supplier rather than 15 different instances of the same supplier. And by understanding your numbers better, you can then leverage that to help make better decisions. And a lot of this can be, can be automated through your conversion process if you think about it in advance and remove a lot of manual cleanup or restructuring to meet the needs of your new requirements. So let's take a look at an example of what we might mean by that. Uh, so this would be an example of a supplier harmonization kind of done at the top level. And you can replicate this process at any number of levels that you want, wanted to. You could also do this at a physical location level or multiple, at multiple levels, a combination of your name and your physical address. So what this is showing here is a sample where we have supplier data that we want to harmonize on the basis of name and tax ID. So by looking at the data combinations, you can see that there's some cases here where we have the same tax ID for different company names. Uh, that should lead to the question of how do I have two different companies with the same tax ID? There are reasons where, why that could happen if you're dealing with subdivisions of a, of a larger company, uh, but by being able to see this early on and make the decisions rather than just assume they should remain as separate suppliers, you can start to realize those benefits right away. So we can see from this top box here that we have Two, two cases of the company names being pretty much exactly the same with the same tax ID, that's a pretty good indication that this really should just be one top level supplier. Now, there may be reasons why you need different physical locations and depending on the target system that you're going into, that may require keeping them separate, but there are systems that structure their information in a different way that will allow you to keep this as one top level supplier uh, with multiple different locations underneath it. And, yeah, and addressing these items, I'm oh, sorry, Kay, addressing these items in that build phase once again is, is key from where you are on the project. Um, obviously, it can happen in the test cycle, but the sooner it can happen, the better. Yeah, and the more that you know about having these scenarios within your data, it allows you to make that informed decision and make sure that you're designing your, in this case, your supplier process for future states based on the understanding of what you've actually got going on in your data today. You may not realize that there's 15 different instances of Samsung Electronics until you start seeing it come out in a report that's pointing it out and putting it right in your face. So thinking about this early in the process, it can be really important. Um, just like with everything else we talk about in terms of cleansing, process owner involvement should be driving this and approving any consolidations that are happening. This is not IT making a decision of, hey, this is the same, I'm gonna combine it. This is the process owner making that decision. And there's some tools that you can use to help make that process easy for them. And then the, 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 the part of this that would fall on the IT side is making sure that that referential integrity of your consolidated data is maintained across all downstream conversions. Uh, and we've, we've run into a lot of cases of clients who have massive, massive duplication issues. Um, we had a client that had a huge problem within their customer data set actually. They were combining several different ERP systems, and they found that they had uh, actually hundreds of thousands of customer records, which seemed a little bit odd to them because they didn't have that many customers. Uh, they had tens of thousands is what they were expecting. And so when we went through this exercise with them, uh, we were merging, I believe, seven different customer masters for them. And across those seven different customer masters, we found more than a 20% redundancy rate. So they were able to cut down the data that they were having to maintain by more than 20%, and that also gave them a much better insight into what their customers were buying and who was doing more of the uh, more of the buying from them. And that's you know one one story, but it's not an uncommon scenario that we run into. So during the build and test phases, uh, you need to start actually doing the heavy lifting and moving your data from legacy to target. Everything we've talked to up to this point is kind of coming through the design phase and leading into the first steps of the build phase. 
when we get to step number six, the automated conversion programs, we're actually now firmly into our build and test phases. So target system vendors often have a defined load process, either using interface tables that they want you to populate or load file templates that they want you to provide with your data in them. Data conversion is more than just the process which consumes these files. Data conversion also includes the extraction of da data from your legacy systems, the application of all these cleansing and harmonization rules that we've been talking through, any transformation or restructuring of your data that's necessary to meet the requirements of your new system, uh, and the ability to quickly react to changing requirements. As you go through your testing and as the business starts to see the new solution, they're going to have changes to how they want things to work. There's going to be things that they thought they wanted and they decide they want it actually some way different. Your conversion process needs to be able to quickly react to and incorporate all of those changes. And then finally, your conversion should also be ensuring that you have integrity across related data areas. Um, so I think I told a story in the last webinar uh, around a client that we had that before we came in was not maintaining that integrity. They were trying to load sales orders that were reflective of customers that they did not load on the customer side. So your conversion should be finding this out before the data fails. Uh, and that leads into kind of the first point here of addressing these issues before they become problems. Conversion programs should have built-in error reporting to make sure that anything which violates the rules set out in your specifications is highlighted and addressed before somebody stumbles upon it in the new system and asks what's going on. Uh, this can extend to uh, a proactive check against target configuration to see if anything is missing before you load. Oftentimes, the load programs in your target system will have some error reporting in them, but it can be very difficult to interpret depending on the type of system that you're going into. So anything you can do to find and address that before you get to that point is going to help your team and also uh, increase your, uh, not increase your timelines, accelerate your timelines. You don't need to wait until design is 100% complete to start building your conversion. In fact, if you wait until your design is 100% locked in, you're going to put yourself at risk of going into conference room pilot without converted data, uh, which is, typically not something that you want to do. You want to make sure that your conference room pilot is using converted data so you understand how your actual data reacts to the processes in the system. Uh, often you can start getting good test results from a conversion process, even with just a 60 to 70% design, knowing that changes will need to be incorporated as they are defined. And by automating your conversion process and using that centralized repository, these types of additions and changes should become very straightforward. So at Premier, yeah, and, and, uh, sorry, Jeff, go no, ahead. Sorry, Kate. I was just saying, yeah, a lot of times we see the um, these underlying issues, the sooner you can identify them, the better, because sometimes they actually turn into a mini project within a project. Um, and, and, and they're identified in that first pilot or the second pilot, then it's too late if you're trying to, you know, hit the timeline that you're trying to do. So the sooner you can get understanding those issues, um, because a lot of times people are in silos on their different areas of what they do, and putting a new ERP system in forces people to centralize and there's a lot more touch points. So there's a learning curve that people just don't have the knowledge of because they don't have the visibility in their current system. So um, the sooner you can find those problems and issues, um, the better. Yeah, we recently started working on a project that had its official kickoff. Uh, I think their official kickoff was a week or two ago. And this client actually had a failed implementation a few years ago, which we were not involved with. Um, the, the client had since changed course. They brought in an entirely new team, including us. They actually also changed uh, the target system that they're going for. That is, they changed their software selection. So as part of this change, we worked closely with their teams for about three weeks prior to the official kickoff. And because we were able to start early and were proactive about data migration, we did a first load of their data that was ready to show the business at their kickoff. So at their kickoff, they were showing their business the new solution with their actual data in the system. Uh, this made the rollout incredibly smooth and made the client very happy. During their prior deployment attempt, they went two years without ever being able to successfully get data into their planned solution because things kept getting pushed while decisions were being made. So there are definite benefits both from a, from a user acceptance perspective and also kind of getting that sense of um, excitement within within your business for this new solution, the sooner that you can show them their actual processes in the new solution. Might not be 100%, uh, but they can start to catch the bug of, hey, this is going to work. 
All right, so finally, once you've done all of your cleansing, you've harmonized your data, and you've used your automated conversions to get the data into your new system, you're at step number seven, which is thorough data validation. Everybody loves data validation. It's uh, often underlooked and misunderstood that simply being able to load data into your target system doesn't mean it's right. In addition to getting the data into the system, it has to be fit for purpose. So good data validation is going to check for that, not just the technical accuracy, but also the business process accuracy and employing sampling to confirm that every aspect of the move was successful. So your team should be defining metrics and error conditions to include as part of this exercise, such as making sure that all your manufactured items have a bomb after the conversion, or making sure your item number follows the different rules that you've defined, or any other number of critical checks specific to your business and your business process. Hand in hand with validation is reconciliation, which is the systemic comparison of your target data back to legacy, making sure that everything ties out. This is crucial for anything financially related, but it can also be used for any type of data that you define um, a reconciliation for. So a recon can involve a record by record comparison to show variance, uh, as you can kind of see an example of in the image to the left here, or a high level execution, a high level exclusion summary that highlights everywhere data was shed along the way, which you can kind of see in the image to the right here. These rules will vary by company, and part of your data migration process should involve defining what you need and ensuring that it's executed upon. This becomes invaluable six months down the line when the auditors show up and want to know how did you confirm that everything was correct and that you didn't lose anything along the way. It's much easier to do it while you're doing your pro uh, project implementation than scrambling to try to recreate it six months after the fact when everybody's moved on. Yeah, okay, that's a great point to bring up about the auditors because that you know, you need to bring them into the cycle of what you're doing and how you're going to validate and reconcile early. You know, let them know the project's going on, what your plans are, and keep them in the loop. So when they do do their audit on the data conversion, they know what the process is, they know what they did. So they're really they're looking at the accuracy and the consistency of what has happened, um, rather than asking for something brand new that you weren't expecting and you don't have and you're going to have to jump through hoops to make that happen. So that kind of brings us back to where we started with the seven steps to data migration success. I think by following these seven steps with the strategic combination of people, process, and technology, you should be well on your way to a successful data migration. Yeah, and there is a lot there, and we've gone through a lot in the last 40, 45 minutes. Um, but that, I think the key point here is when you look at your implementation, if you're a PM and you just about start this project, your data warehouse is a huge project within that project. And take the time, see it as a separate project, um, and don't just, you know, we see a lot of organizations focusing on processes and trying to get business decisions to get it up and running. But this piece can, can, if it's not done well, can grind your project to a halt, and it can delay things, and Kate's thrown out a few examples of that. Um, or then she could, if you sit down with her for a couple of hours, she'll she'll give you a lot more examples of where that you know Premier International come in and, and save projects um, where things haven't gone well. So go through these steps, take your time to do it, um, document it, and you know obviously you can always reach out to you know Panorama or Premier International, and we can provide uh, more information. So just going back to the free consulting hour from Panorama Consulting. Um, there's a free hour. You can go out to um, panoramaconsulting.com, enter the code, you know, contact us, enter the code free hour, and, um, you know, give your comments of how we can help you, and, and we can set that time up, and um, especially if you're at the beginning of the project and you kind of want to bounce some ideas off, um, you need ways to communicate things to the uh, your core team or you want to communicate things to the executive team, uh, we can definitely help out there. So the next thing is, is questions, and your questions have been coming through um, as we have gone through, which we greatly appreciate. Um, Kate, the first one I have here, um, let's see what it is, is, um, is a centralized data repository, repository sorry, different than a data lake? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, a lot of people are starting to, to look more into the concept of a data lake, uh, especially as they become more available. A data lake is a fantastic tool from a BI perspective. Uh, from a data conversion perspective, there's a lot of limitations. 
Um, also, a lot of people who have been early adopters of data lakes have been finding that there are some security issues as well. It's not as secure maybe as some, some other um, structured databases might be. When it comes to a data migration, you're going to be trying to manipulate your data and change your data content as part of the move. Within, because of the way that data is not structured in the data lake, that can be much more difficult, um, especially without specialized training. So, Kate, can you just expand a little bit, McSperno, of what a data lake is for those that don't know? Sure. Um, so, a, a data lake, if you've heard about um, technologies such as like um, Hadoop or um, Mondo or NoSQL, you start seeing that behind that, you have essentially a large unstructured pool of data. And when I say unstructured, if you think of a traditional database, you have tables, and within those tables you have fields, each of which contains a discrete piece of information. Within a data lake, you find that it's much more unstructured, which allows you to process large amounts of data much more quickly than you can in a traditionally structured environment, which is why it's very good from a BI perspective. Uh, but when you're starting to try to manipulate data, it's a lot more difficult to, to find what it is that you need to change programmatically from a conversion perspective. So that, that's why you, you typically see data lakes residing behind a lot of these uh, very exciting and flashy uh, BI tools that have come out recently. Great. Um, all right, going to the next question, how many conversion testing cycles um, does an organization need? Yeah, I'm gonna use my favorite answer again, it depends. Um, it depends on the length of your deployment, it depends on the complexity of your business and the size of your business. A good rule of thumb is you probably want to have two to three test cycles minimum before your go live. Your first test cycle tends to be more of a discovery phase where people are seeing things in the new solution for the first time. They're starting to realize what they like, what they don't like, what they want to change. You're starting to uncover some more of those gaps that maybe you didn't realize that you had. Uh, your second test cycle then becomes much more complete and allows for much more thorough validation and testing. But there, there will still be some, some tweaks and some issues that come out of that. So those would be, if you equate those roughly to maybe a conference room pilot and then potentially a conference room pilot too. Uh, and then that third test cycle would be essentially your dress rehearsal and your user acceptance test cycle. So you would expect that your third test cycle would be where everything is locked. I'm not making any changes after this point. If something is broken, um, then we need to come up with a solution to, to correct it. Um, and so then that would lead into your go live. So that's a, generally where you are. In terms of testing. Yeah, and I think one piece I'd add to that is you've got to listen to your process and data owners and they'll tell you. Because at the end of the day, they have to sign up the sign off that they're comfortable with the data. Um, so not you know, just saying it's gonna be three or it's gonna be five or it's gonna be ten or whatever it is. It's really getting their feedback and where their comfort level is. And there'll be some areas that will be comfortable sooner than others. Um, but they are the people that make the decision, right? It's not the PM, it's not the executive team. When it comes to data and comfortability, it's gotta be those process and data owners. Because um, they have to live with the, all the issues that come up with them. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that's, those are really good points. And that's part of the reason why it's important to start your data work early, because you want your data conversion testing to align as much as it can with your process testing. Because you will find things when you transact on converted data that you won't find if you're just looking at data from a, from a spreadsheet or from a back end or from a, from a dump. So I've got another question here, Kate. Um, if we harmonize customers or supply data, how do we ensure data stream orders, or oh, sorry, downstream orders, open AR, open AP, et cetera, retain their integrity? So this becomes part of your harmonization design. So we talked a little bit uh, during this, this session about coming up with the plan for how you're going to harmonize your data and talk through a few examples. So the decision needs to be made between the business and the functional team, how they want to, to manage that. Typically, the solution involves generating a cross-reference as part of that harmonization. So I have four suppliers before they're going to become one supplier now. As part of your conversion, you're generating a cross-reference that says these four become this one value. And that, that cross-reference then gets referenced in your downstream conversion. So if we're talking suppliers, your downstream conversion might include a supplier bank conversion or purchase order or an open AP conversion. So having that cross-reference ensures that the integrity is getting retained all the way through the process and that every time that you see those four suppliers, they convert as the one. Got it. 
All right, I think we have time for one more, and probably like the longest question we have here. Um, our design phase will overlap with our testing phase, and we expect our conversion requirements to continually change as they go through testing. Should we wait to start the conversion until after we finalize all of our requirements? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, and I think my response to that would, would be that your conversion process is going to be in a state of constant change initially. You're going to continually uncover things as you go through the design phase. But the sooner that you begin the conversion process, the sooner you're going to be able to validate your data and uncover some of the issues that you might have overlooked or find cases where what you think is in your data is not what, what is actually in your data. By starting early, it will give you adequate time to add or alter your requirements as, as necessary. Now, I'm not suggesting that you start building your conversions when you only know 20% of the design. That could lead to a lot of rework. But once you're getting to that 60 to 70% locked in percentage, you probably have enough to find that you can start building things out. Yes, you will need to tweak it as the rest of the 30 to 40% is defined. Uh, but you're going to be much further down the road and it's going to be much less scrambling to make sure that you have data ready for your test cycles. Yeah, I think the, the piece is, you know, with these projects, especially with data conversion, it is a little bit like rowing a boat across the Atlantic. And it takes time, but it's the evolution of learning and, that, and giving you that time to learn and adjust. And that's constantly what this data conversion is, right? You're going to get data, you understand it. You'll make tweaks at the same time as a process owner, data owner, you're learning the new system and what that process is. And it's a constant feedback and going through that cycle. It's just keeping those cycles in sync um, and having that constant feedback and going through that process. So um, definitely be patient in the process. Things will go wrong. Things will come up that you're not expecting. Um, and just that so you know that is normal. Um, but if you have the right framework in, and going back to what Kate talked about, before the right communication and regular communication, um, you're definitely, you know, ahead of most organizations that we walk into to, to help. So the last piece we have on this fine day is uh, contact information. So if you would like to contact um, Premier International, Kate Miller, the information is there for you. If you want to contact Panorama International, we've got Laura. Laura Florence, who's the Director of Business Development. So don't hesitate to give us an email, um, give us a call. Um, if you just kind of, you know, just about start your process and have some questions, um, or you need a little bit more insight, we're definitely here to help. Um, we have seen a lot of things go wrong on projects, um, and, we've, and we, we kind of know all the pitfalls, so we can definitely help you out there. So Kate, I greatly appreciate your um, participation today and, and insight, as always. And um, for everyone listening, um, enjoy the rest of your day and then give us a call if you have any questions. All right. Thanks for the platform, Jeff. We appreciate it. And we look forward to hearing from anyone who might have uh, additional questions. All right. Thank you.